So hi, welcome everyone. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Eric White, um, who I've known since graduate school at Cornell and who many of you know is one of the most distinguished scholars of Thai Buddhism and Southeast Asian Buddhism generally um, in working in North America right now. Eric is an independent scholar who has previously taught at Antioch University, Cornell University, and the University of Michigan. His research explores the cultural politics of popular religion in Thailand, the subculture and religious careers of Bangkok professional spirit mediums, and the social cultural dynamics underlying claims to authority and charisma in Theravada Buddhism. He's the author of numerous book chapters and journal articles, including Contemporary Buddhism and Magic, the Cultural Politics of the Supernatural in Theravada Buddhist Thailand, Rethinking Vernacular Religion Across Mainland Southeast Asia, Rethinking Anthropological Models of Spirit Possession in Theravada Buddhism, and Fraudulent and Dangerous Popular Religiosity in the Public Sphere, Moral Campaigns to Prohibit, Reform, and Demystify Thai Spirit Mediums. He's currently in the process of drafting a book manuscript entitled Spirit Possessions as Buddhist Vocation, Reimagining Piety in Modern Thailand. Um, I think some of what he'll be talking about will be engaging with the topics of that book. Um, so please join me in welcoming Eric White for today's talk, Spirit Possession in Buddhist Southeast Asia. Eric? Okay, thank you, Eric, for that introduction. Thank you, uh, thanks to the council for inviting me to give a talk and for Chris for managing the details and for everyone showing up digitally from wherever you are uh, in the world and time zone. Um, I will share my screen. So um, my talk today uh, is actually about a book. Uh, it's not the my book in progress. It's uh, an edited volume that just recently came out, uh, Spirit Possession in Buddhist Southeast Asia, Worlds Ever More Enchanted. I contributed the afterword to it. Um, and, um, you know, basically, I do think it's an important book, groundbreaking, and I, uh, I'll just say a few things about initially why. Um, you know, scholars have been working on Spirit Possession in Buddhist Southeast Asia for a long time. But this is the first book that has actually brought scholars together who have been studying across different regions and countries uh, in mainland Southeast Asia and putting their observation and arguments into conversation with each other. Um, you know, it brings together scholars who have worked across the different Theravada majority countries in Southeast Asia. That's unusual. It's also included in the mix of scholarship work on spirit possession in Vietnam. That's even more unusual. Spirit possession and work on spirit possession in Vietnam has tended to be siloed in many ways. Um, and um, the book also brings together multiple generations of scholars. So the editors, Benedict and Peter, you know, they began working and writing about spirit possession in the 1980s. And Irene Stengs and I, began working and writing on the topic in the 1990s, but the remaining eight uh, scholars in the book who contributed the book, you know, began working in either the 2000s or the 2010s. So there really is a kind of cross-generational uh, cohort sort of conversation going on in the book, and that's unusual. Um, you know, basically, as you can see from the table of contents, there's, there's like 10 case studies, and then uh, five in, in set up, uh, five are coming out of work in Thailand, two out of work in Myanmar, two out of work in Cambodia, one from Vietnam. Um, it's too bad there's not more from Vietnam, but there's sort of size limitations. Um, and then there's an introduction and an afterwards, and both the introduction and the afterwards, a sense, you know, take a, take the measure of the different contributions and place them in terms of the the existing scholarship, and then point towards paths forward. Um, and so I'm going to be, you know, my talk today is about the book and its importance and, and the contribution it makes to the ongoing conversation. Um, but there's some caveats. It's not 
my talk isn't simply a re recapitulation of the afterword, um, and it's not a detailed or exhaustive discussion of the book's content and its particular chapters. It's I'm trying to I want to sketch a broader, in general terms, the intellectual value of the book, and to make sense of it um, and its contributions. I want to place the book in a larger and longer intellectual history of the study of spirit possession in Buddhist Southeast Asia and see the book as contributing to an ongoing conversation and debate that's happened across scholarly generations. And as you'll see, I place the, the work in this volume in sort of what I call, what I term the third generation of scholarship on the topic. Um, and basically I'm gonna be talking about you know, the way empirical foci of studies, the analytics themes and the theoretical conceptions have shifted across those generations and, um, and in a kind of cumulative evolving way. Um, but I'm not suggesting that later generations simply replace the prior generations, uh, you know, topics and themes and analyses, but sort of layered and supplemented um, and sometimes with, you know, agreement and, and disagreement. Um, and the other qualification is I'm leaving out for the most part detailed bibliographic and citational references. Um, uh, I've mapped these scholarly generational cohorts in these sort of 20 year uh, uh, groupings, which is obviously kind of artificial and I paint with a necessarily broad brush. So there are obvious exceptions to some of the claims I'm making. Um, when I talk about spirit possession in Buddhist Southeast Asia, I'm talking about the mainland. So I exclude, you know, Buddhism in insular Southeast Asia. And I also exclude discussions about the geographic borderlands of mainland Buddhist Southeast Asia, like Northern Malaysia, Southern China, Bangladesh, even India. Um, and the other thing is I'm not talking about spirit possession in upland societies and cultures. I'm talking about it in lowland societies and cultures. It's a, it's a whole different sort of, the, the conversation and debates are a whole different beast in, the, in terms of the uplands. Um, and there's likely a Thai-centric bias to the kind of intellectual history I'm gonna give. And it's mostly, my discussion's mostly probably rooted in English language scholarship. Um, so, you know, Unlike my afterword, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the prehistory of the study of spirit possession in Buddhist Southeast Asia, which is to say there's this first generation that I see is starting in the around, you know, from 1965. But, but the way spirit possession and Buddhism is thought about before this time period is important for understanding what happens later. It kind of haunts and even shapes the kinds of conversations. There's sort of foundational ideas that are sort of laid down in dilemmas uh, and they continue to reverberate. And that's, you'll see that's part of the discussion uh, that I, uh, I'm presenting to you. Um, and I've given, I've tried to give little tropes, descriptive tropes for each of these sort of generations. And in the case of the prehistory, um, I talk about spirit possession ignored or marginalized. So basically, you know, in this earliest period, you know, spirit possession in general has always been stigmatized within both colonial and post-colonial scholarship on religion. It is seen as a remnant of the historical and civilizational precursors to the world of historical religions. People don't talk about spirit mediums and spirit possession being central to uh, you know, um, the, the, the vision of the ethic of, of the ethical good life and the practices and of how to gain transcendence. If you're, you know, a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or, you know, Judaism or whatnot, it's, you know, in that sense, spirit position, possession has always been located as a kind of relic or survival of a pre-world historical religious imaginary. And you can see that in many common semantic associations of spirit possession, uh, shamanism, magic, divination, superstition, animism, spirit cults, these are all terms that are circulate around it or sometimes can uh, serve as a replacement. I mean, and they all sort of point to a pre-world historic religion 
religious imaginary. And oftentimes spirit possession, I think, is seen as a kind of descendant or stepchild of, of shamanism. Um, and but this has created a kind of foundational conceptual dilemma. Spirit possession is always constituted as radically other to and outside the world historical religions. And this historical and civilizational framing creates this enduring dilemma about how to understand the relationship between spirit position, possession and world historical religions. Spirit possession all, tends to always look like something illicit, which doesn't belong in a world religion, but has been surreptitiously smuggled into it. And for scholars of Southeast Asian Buddhism, they've tended to conceptualize this relationship and this belonging and this smuggling through the lens of this idea of syncretism, which I will talk about along the way. Um, so, you know, you can see in this earliest period of scholarship, it's spirit possession has been ignored and marginalized in the study of Southeast Asian Buddhism because scholars are working on, you know, documenting, studying things that were seen as more canonical, widespread and mainstream. Um, and spirit mediums and possession didn't seem to have any relation to these, right? So making sense of monks and lady and, and their relations to each other, making sense of monasteries and temple life. What is the Sangha? What is monastic life? What's the renunciatory path? Different kinds of rituals and actions like meditation and merit making and ritual cycles. Uh, you know, how to understand cosmology and karma and rebirth, how to understand nirvana and practical ethics and what the good life is, you know, for most scholars, uh, especially, you know, in the colonial, post-colonial era, spirit possession and spirit mediums have seemed irrelevant to sort of really making sense of all of that. So you can basically see that sort of Buddhologists and religious studies scholars who work with primarily sort of canonical literary sources um, in Southeast Asia of Theravada Buddhism, you know, those sources are silent for the most part about spirit possession and spirit mediums, or they have negative representations of them in terms of malevolence and inauspiciousness and beastly arts and things that need to be exercised. Um, and there's also no real obvious institutional presence or significance of spirit possession in the region, which is different than Tibetan Buddhism, which has state oracles, right? You have highly accomplished monastics uh, who are possessed by, uh, guardian deities, and then, um, you know, the Dalai Lama and other figures consult with these possessed beings, right? So uh, there's nothing like state oracles in the Tibetan or in the, in the Southeast Asian Buddhist tradition. Um, you know, it's been marginalized by historians and anthropologists. There aren't many historical references to spirit possession in archival sources. They didn't, you know, their voices weren't recorded. They didn't produce records uh, that were, you know, preserved. Um, anthropologists have been the, the ones who have, you know, recognized and focused on spirit possession the most, and it makes frequent appearances in anthropological studies, but usually it's relatively brief because they themselves, anthropologists are focusing on those same kind of more mainstream conventional sorts of uh, topics. Um, and this is even true in later generations of scholarship after 1965. There's an explosion of ethnographies written by anthropologists about Buddhism in Southeast Asia. And um, usually discussions of spirit possession sort of show up in a, you know, a paragraph or two or some footnotes or whatnot. So, um, the first kind of exceptions to this came with anthropologists, and anthropologists have been the majority of the scholars looking at spirit possession uh, in Southeast Asia. So there was a certain, you know, there was an exception to the rule in terms of even anthropologists, uh, and I see this as the, this first generation of scholarship, and I see it in this, this era from 1965 to 1985, and my trope is, you know, they think of spirit possession as this domesticated niche within Buddhist Southeast Asia. So there's basically three uh, scholars, Melford Spiro, who worked uh, looked at possession and the Nat cults in Burma, um, and Stanley Tambaya, who worked on, uh, studied possession in the context of spirit cults in Northeast Thailand, and uh, A. Thomas Kirsch, who worked on uh, spirit possession and the sort of the Buddhist order in also in Northeast Thailand. Um, 
And there's not a lot of other scholars who really sort of focus in with much more, you know, with much more depth in terms of spirit possession uh, during this period. But, um, but these are sort of primary sources that people keep going back to for reference points in, in later generations. Um, so basically you have them, they've been working in Myanmar and Thailand. These seminal pieces or scholarship didn't, aren't really centered in Laos, although you can think about Northeast Thailand as sort of a, an ethnic Lao uh, sort of borderland between Siam or, or Thailand and Laos, um, but no, nobody's really from uh, Cambodia. Um, and, you know, these scholars focused on certain empirical sorts of things. They spent a lot of time elaborating the ties of spirit possession to pre-Buddhist religiosity and animism and or the spirit cults. Um, they saw spirit possession as strongly emblematic of local and of the local folk religiosity found in rural peasant, excuse me, society and culture. They spent a decent amount of time thinking about trance and how that related to other kinds of ritual experiences, but also looking at the ritual process that spirit mediums took part in and how it played out and the way it was part of a ritual healing. Um, uh, Spiro actually said his book was called Burmese Supernaturalism. He said you, he could have entitled it instead Burmese Medicine. Uh, that was the, that's how closely he saw these kinds of uh, topics. Um, they all tend to look at spirit possession and spirit mediums as providing this narrow set of mundane worldly benefits that were really not, they didn't see as provided by Orthodox Buddhist actors or activities, right? So it's not just that you don't turn to a spirit medium for help in terms of gaining uh, uh, liberation from samsara or in terms of a better rebirth, or even in terms of some of like the kind of benefits you could get from merit making. Instead, it's, you know, narrower kinds of things in terms of local concerns, right? Violating, you know, norms about belonging in kinship groups or in like village communities or sexual ethoses and, and rules and whatnot. So, um, or healing of particular kinds of illnesses that have been brought about by uh, maybe uh, affliction by malevolent beings and whatnot. So, um, and the other thing they all talk about is how these spirit possession provides a sort of a, a, a stage in which there's a kind of sanctioned Bacchanalian excess and pleasure. And that this has a certain, you know, it's like a, it's like a legitimate kind of a violation of conventional Buddhist norms in terms of drinking and uh, for rev revelry and all this other stuff. Um, um, and they all to, in various degrees map out how spirit mediums uh, are this, you know, constitute are one end of a pole of a kind of segregated structural opposition between from spirit mediums to Buddhist monks. And they'll they look at it in terms of like the kinds of rituals they perform engage in, the the behavioral ethos, um, even their presence on a ritual stage. They will talk about how, you know, uh, Buddhist monks exit when, you know, then later, you know, spirit mediums will enter, even if it's a kind of conjoint ritual in some sense. They're almost spatially and temporally segregated in many ways, and there's a reticence in their kind of engagement. Um, you know, analytically, these scholars are spending a lot of time trying to make sense of the character and dynamics of syncretism, which, you know, is related and, and how these different pieces sort of fit together, how spirit mediums and spirit possession sort of sits inside of a world structured and dominated by Buddhist values and, and uh, principles. Um, they're also all to some degree working with this question of the great tradition and the little tradition and how Buddhism as a world historical religion has been localized uh, in, in the region, but also within agricultural communities. They're all sort of trying to map the total religious field of these rural peasant villages where they did their research. Um, uh, Tambaya has this sort of, you know, a famous uh, map of a sort of a, a four part map of these different religious sort of virtuosos, monks and mediums and the, uh, the masters of vital essences and exorcists and the different kinds of rituals and, and uh, performative and even material cultures that sort of uh, spread out of that. Kirsch tends to talk about Buddhist 
and Brahmanical and animistic sort of uh, divisions in the religious field and, is, and how they are related to each other, right? Um, and um, they're all sort of, you know, to the degree they focus on spirit mediums and spirit possession, it's in order to illuminate this larger puzzle of how syncretism works, how localization works, how the religious field works. Um, so their discussions of spirit possession, and spirit mediums are sort of, um, are, are, are roots into that. Um, and they all approach these from different kinds of perspectives um, in the anthropological tradition. Um, Spiro has a kind of functionalist and he's a psychological anthropologist informed by Freudian uh, kinds of thinking. Tambaya is, is sort of more of a British social uh, anthropologist informed by structuralist kinds of models. Kirsch uh, is an American trained uh, who's been formed by Parsons and his vision of sort of sociological sort of dynamics and structure. Um, and the way they conceptualize spirit position in Southeast Asian Buddhism, they tend to talk about it in terms of, like I said, syncretism. Kirsch uses this language of inclusive syncretism. I've sort of tended to add hegemonic on to that. So Spirit possession is seen as hegemonically dominated by Buddhism. It's domesticated and constrained in its practices and actions and scope by Buddhist actors and institutions and beliefs and practices. Um, there's even a sense, especially from Kirsch, that historically spirit possession has been, if it is this remnant of a pre-Buddhist kind of worldview, it's been reconfigured over time and even fragmented in certain ways so that it is ultimately subordinate to Buddhist values and goals and frames of references. And spirit possession therefore is seen as essentially kind of peripheral to the normative mainstream Orthodox Buddhist order. And it, and it provides these specialized niche of uh, unique but relatively marginal services, activities, experience and functions for rural village Southeast Asians. Um, when looked at from the, the frame of what a Buddhist good life is and what uh, moral practices and ritual practices one should engage in. And I just want to emphasize here this, these, these terms of like dominated, constrained, subordinated, peripheral, marginal, because, you know, not to sort of ruin the plot line of the rest of the talk, but you could see uh, the later generations as, in different ways, essentially challenging these kinds of this language, uh, qualifying it, maybe pushing back even more in terms of dismantling it or disagreeing with it, displacing it, or even, uh, you know, inverting these kinds of claims um, uh, as they encounter um, uh, spirit possession in Buddhist Southeast Asia. And, you know, the thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, uh, the later generations are encountering uh, a different, you know, spirit possession itself and spirit mediums are changing, right, in the se subsequent decades. So the scholars are encountering, uh, you know, uh, transformed visions of spirit possession and spirit mediumship. And also um, they're encountering, uh, you know, a, a, it's a totally transformed kind of Buddhist world and broader social world as well. So the second generation I see is this 20 year period from 1985 to 2005. And this is when uh, basically you're thinking about the trope is spirit possession as religious innovation within Buddhist Southeast Asia. So, you know, Myanmar as a site of study of spirit possession in Buddhist Southeast Asia has fades in this era because people, you know, anthropologists who the primary people studying uh, this phenomenon, obviously for political reasons, I found it difficult to get into the country. Um, and the one exception is Benedict Brack de la Perrier, who, you know, wrote a book and many articles on the cult of the 37 knots following in Spiro's uh, footprints. Um, but other than that, it, it work sort of dwindles. Um, there's some historical work. So the most of the scholarship in this period is, comes out of Thailand, frankly. Um, it's the topic still isn't on the horizons for people working in Laos or Cambodia the same way. Um, 
And this, these studies are strongly shaped by this intensifying post-World War II transformation of Thailand that began before this period, right, in the 60s and then essentially the 70s. Um, you know, you have extensive rural urban migration, exploding urbanization, a rapid growth in education, especially higher education, the intensification of capitalist development, the growth of a professional middle class, deepening democratization and expansion of civil society, burgeoning mass media, intensifying nationalism, and even the revival of the monarchy. And all of these, I won't go into the details, but they all sort of fit into, you know, these are the forces that are transforming spirit possession and spirit mediumship on the ground. Um, so in terms of new foci that come up, all of a sudden you see all these study, a lot of these studies talk about the, you know, spirit mediums in cities, the discovery of spirit mediums in cities like Chiang Mai and Bangkok and Khan Can in particular. And, um, you know, people didn't talk about, prior generations didn't talk about spirit mediums in cities. Um, these new generation also, really digs into, you know, they're, they're, the other thing about their scholarship is unlike uh, Spiro, Tambay, and Kirsch, they, they have a lot, you know, their, their publications are focused sort of exclusively on spirit mediums and going into detail about mediums and possession. Um, a lot of articles, no books. So they go into, you know, unpacking the biographies of individual spirit mediums and how individuals become spirit mediums in much fuller kind of uh, details. So, uh, taking apart hagiographies, taking apart oral accounts of their, of how individuals became spirit mediums. Um, there's also a lot of documentation about how spirit mediums sit at the center of and embedded within master student lineages of instruction of various sorts with actual individuals and with mythic figures. And this was not really discussed much in the prior generations. Um, there's a lot of work on how spirit mediums sit at the center of, they have an entourage of followers, a network of patrons, circles of clients, they have their own students as well. And so sort of uh, describing and mapping that is important for making sense of what spirit possession is. Um, and sometimes, you know, these groups even become more like religious movements or cults of a even kind of broader, um, scale. Um, there's a lot of discussion about how, you know, the way in which these sort of spirit mediums found in cities are, are following vocational careers. You know, in prior, you know, prior studies of spirit mediumship in rural areas would often talk about how individuals become, you know, who spirit mediums would become possessed occasionally during certain kinds of ceremonies or in certain kinds of crises, certain kinds of annual cycles. But the spirit mediums in these cities are basically like they're hanging up a shingle and they are sort of available to help people, you know, day in, you know, uh, like every week and sometimes, you know, multiple days during the week. So um, they really are sort of like vocational careers. They are, they are you know, often uh, religious careers of virtuoso in which, you know, that's actually a primary means by which they're supporting themselves in terms of livelihood. There's also a discussion about how there's growing numbers. Every, everyone's talking about how there's growing numbers of them across the, the country and within regions and the diversifying demographics of them so that there's not just, you know, there used to be the notion that spirit mediums were mostly women and or transgendered uh, uh, people, but you know, increasingly there's a recognition that, you know, uh, there's, there's cisgendered males and other folks doing this. Um, so that's part of the sort of the uh, making sense of who spirit mediums are and what spirit possession is. Um, and there's also this overwhelming sense that spirit mediums uh, and spirit possession itself is newly assertive as a public presence and has a kind of prominence in, in uh, local settings and in the country, both in terms of in person, the kind of rituals they're performing in public, but also in terms of the mass media, mass media sort of popular mass media, Thai language mass media picks them up, looks at them, examines them. Um, they write their own sort of accounts of their experiences and, and have those sort of placed inside of mass media. Um, there's a, you know, uh, the vision, the, the, the image of spirit mediums also focuses on 
how they forge social, financial, and ritual relations, sometimes contentious, sometimes idiosyncratic with Buddhist monks, typically with them as junior partners. So there's this sense of, there's a lot more documentation about how spirit mediums have these sort of um, somewhat tense and complicated relationships with particular monks in, in this or that location or temple in, in, engaged in joint kinds of uh, religious projects or ritual activity. And that wasn't really emphasized or even uh, uh, present in, in the prior generation scholarship. And then there's just this general sense that spirit mediums are these innovative religious entrepreneurs. There's, there's, whole, you know, there's a lot of documentation about these new kinds of gods that are possessing them that are drawn from Chinese pantheons or Hindu pantheons, Indian pantheons, uh, pantheons of royal figures. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of focus on they're doing new kinds of rituals and techniques. Um, uh, some drawn from Buddhist actors, some drawn from astrologers, uh, whatnot. Um, they use, they talk a lot about merit, bun and barami, sort of perfected virtue and other kinds of Buddhist terminologies to make sense of their experience of possession and the power of the possessing deities. These deities are seen as, as repositories of bun barami. This is not the way people talked about the kinds of spirits that possessed, you know, figures in the prior generations studies. Um, and uh, there's a lot of discussion about how these sorts of spirit mediums have display a behavior that mimics normative Buddhist ethos. They're like vegetarians and they sometimes, you know, are very display very prominently their celibate, uh, that they engaged in, they engage in meditation, that they sponsor uh, merit making activities and all this other uh, sorts of elements that make them look more proper and normative and pious. And, um, and these, these spirit mediums are also shown as sort of, um, you know, they're drawing on Buddhist, mainstream Buddhist material and visual cultures. They make amulets of the gods uh, that possess them. Uh, they make statues of the gods or they, um, and whatnot. So they're sort of much more embedded in uh, the kind of visual material uh, performative culture of, of Southeast Asian Buddhism, uh, Thai Buddhism. Um, very quickly, the analytic themes is, they, you know, there's this sense that uh, analyses of how the spirit mediums are remaking village religiosity in the city, either rural migrants uh, who have brought it with them or mobile urbanites who have encountered it in their travels around the country. Um, there's an analysis of how you basically have an ethnic majority tie sort of appropriating and reworking elements from ethnic minority religions like Chinese popular religion or Indian popular religion in terms of their religious self identities and how they're appropriating and reworking royalist sacrality, um, even as they're non royals in the sense that uh, uh, they're possessed by these sort of uh, past royal uh past kings and monarchs and royal figures um and you know there's there's always this sense that these kinds of spirit mediums this kind of possession is speaking to uh you know it's a newly it's a newly constituted kind of religious identity and vocational career and that it's designed to satisfy new clientels and followers uh migrants proletariats uh, in the city, professionalized middle classes, even educated globalized elites. Um, and so there's this sense of spirit mediums as these religious entrepreneurs who are trafficking and providing a kind of stigmatized, often stigmatized form of worldly prosperity religion. People talk about le them as leaders of prosperity cults. Peter Jackson had a, you know, put spirit mediums along with other kinds of figures who led prosperity cults in the 80s and 90s uh, and beyond. And he's, he's written about that. Um, and basically, you know, when you try to, when these scholars, second generation tries to conceptualize spirit possession in relation to Southeast Asian Buddhism, they talk about syncretism still, although there's uh, more tensions and anxiety about it. So I would see it as sort of thinking about fractious inclusive syncretism. It doesn't seem to fit as 
neatly as it used to. And um, some of them jettison the idea of syncretism and want to talk about other things like hybridity. Patana Kitiarsa scholarship focuses on that. So, but, you know, the way spirit position is, possession is now seen as situated inside of Southeast Asian Buddhism is that, you know, it's sort of incorporating and using normative Buddhist beliefs and practices to justify their existence, a kind of Buddhistization of possession. And therefore, there's more discussion about idiosyncratic or unorthodox and even heterodox ways that spirit mediums act with regards to Buddhist beliefs and practices. Uh, Marjorie Muck has this famous essay where, you know, she, she documents uh, three monks who are essentially students of a spirit medium and act, you know, and, and very, you know, clearly sort of uh, defer in terms of authority to the spirit medium. Um, um, and there's more discussion about how there's this tension and conflict between spirit mediums and Buddhist monks, as well as the Sangha and the mainstream Buddhism. And spirit mediums are seen as sort of speaking back and criticizing the Sangha and monks and sometimes mainstream Buddhists. Um, so in all these ways, you know, uh, these, this, this second generation of, of work on spirit possession in Buddhist Southeast Asia has emphasized the way it strains the image of this kind of uncontested hegemonic inclusivism, inclusive syncretism. Um, and that it strains the image that they're just a specialized niche providing unique but relatively marginal services because they're, they are you know, providing a wider set of services that are more conventional and mainstream. And that clearly uh, this idea of a, a segregated structural opposition between spirit mediums and monks is, uh, is seen as questionable uh, or sort of faltering. So then we come to the third generation of scholarship, which is where I see this, the, the, the contributions to this book uh, being placed. And my trope, I'm not totally happy with it. I'm interested. That's what we're hearing now. That's what we're hearing, okay. Is multiple spirit possessions as alternative pieties within Buddhist Southeast Asia. Um, so that's basically where I would place, you know, the, the, the works in this volume. Um, they, I think, foreground. Hey, everybody, bear with us as we try to figure out what happened to Eric's uh, connection. <clears throat> I'll send him a brief email, just one second. Um, and um, there's also the sense that they're engaged with more than just monks. Usually the discussion was always about spirit mediums and monks in relation to each other, but they're also seen, you know, interacting with state brokers and civil society heritage. Um, these, you know, mediums now also um, are you know, even more deeply engaged with like culture industries and print and digital mass media and social media. They use social media to to expand and preserve their entourages and to reach out to clientele um, to record, you know, uh, ceremonies and rituals they take part in. Um, um, and that actually sometimes there's even another element that's new is their social organization becomes even more complex. One of the articles in the book talks about how there was a temporarily a kind of effort to create an association of spirit in, in Chiang Mai uh, with formal kinds of you know positions and authority and relations that it apart for various reasons that you can read the article about. Um, and there's even cases of another thing that scholars have noticed. There's cases of the sort of the role of spirit mediums and Buddhist monks actually collapsing into each other. There's more, you know, documentation of individuals who ordain temporarily as monks, but who are and have been spirit mediums in the past. And the complicated way they negotiate that kind of uh, wearing both of those hats, even if only temporarily. Um, and a final element that you see in a lot of the scholarship is that the you know, there's a sense that France and possession and possession like behavior actually extends beyond just self-identified spirit medium. That 
that you find other actors, including Monk, whether it's, you know, it's in visions or dreams or trance-like behavior, you know, they're doing things that echo uh, what sort of looks like possession and has possession-like qualities, and they valorize it. They give it different terms and languages, um, but there's a kind of uh, uh, similarity. And so, you know, basically, um, uh, you know, analytically, the other thing that the new scholarship looks at that you find in this book is that Scholars are situating spirit mediums and spirit possession in relation to vernacular Buddhist beliefs and practices on the ground rather than the official literary Buddhisms that are conveying canonical establishment or elite voices. So there's sort of uh, more ground and room for spirit mediums and spirit possession to sort of claim a kind of value and legitimate based on the... Um, and the other thing, other analytics, is that um, are uh, in the past it was only thinking about them in relation to like monks and the sangha and or the state, but increasingly there's a lot of attention paid to the way they relate to the market in terms of commercialism and commodification, the way they relate to civil society in terms of culture, industry, media. Academics, academic scholarship, uh, book associations, cultural heritage, and tourism. So the broadening of the sense of what, how spirit position and spirit mediums side of the larger social uh, terrain beyond just. Um, so the final point I was going to make essentially is when it comes to conceptualizing spirit possession in Southeast Asian Buddhism in this, in this generation or this third generation, um, people still talk about syncretism, but there's a lot of anxiety about it and how to characterize it. Um, you know, I've added adjectives when I read people's scholarship. Sometimes they seem to be talking about like siloed forms of syncretism or fissured forms of syncretism or competitive forms of syncretism. Others have started to try to reach for language like polytropy or creolization as they continue to struggle to make sense of how spirit possession fits inside of a, a Buddhist dominated kind of religious world. Um, and um, so, um, actually, there's been this growing sense that, like, the conventional way of dividing up the religious world that's medically mixed together is too limited, right? You can't just talk about Buddhism and Brahmanism and animism. There's other elements, whether it's Hinduism or royal stuff or curiosity, a number of other kinds of ways of thinking about influences and in religious traditions that are sort of make up the total mix. And therefore, that also opens up ways in which where they locate. In the, in the first generation of scholars all located spare possession inside of sort of animism, which was the most subordinated element. But now you can see how spirit meetings and spirit possession can set inside of a lot of other kinds of traditions of religious, you know, tradition and practice if you expand the horizons of, of what of what this composite Southeast Asian Buddhist world looks like historically. So, you know, the final point that I would make is that all of this is to say that amongst these most current scholars of spirit possession that you will find in this book, um, you know, they all, for them, it's all much more difficult to claim that spirit possession and spirit mediums are so easily or effectively dominated, constrained, subordinated, peripheralized, or marginalized overarching Buddhist social order because they have been encountering more and more spirit mediums who themselves are pushing back against that and claiming that they do fit inside, they do belong uh, inside that world as good, proper uh, Buddhists in the uh, And so both the, a lot of the spirit mediums that are encountered and then the scholars themselves studying that are, you know, uh, end up taking positions quite different 
first generation of solid. Uh, the parameters of how to find out spirit possession is Southeast Asia. So that's, I'll end it there. Sorry. Great. Thank you, Eric. And, and thank you for um, responding to the technical difficulty and, and continuing with the end of the talk. I really appreciate that. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll open it up to Q&A for a little bit. Um, can I ask everyone when you say your Q&A, just make sure that Eric was able to hear the answer clearly, uh, the question clearly be before, once you've completed, just to make sure that we have a clear line of communication going here. Um, are there any uh, hands who would like to go first with a question? I'm Thanks back. So oh, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to. I'm going to kill the phone. It's, I'm getting a I'm getting a rebound from it. Okay, Eric. Okay, so Thomas Eric, Porcher and then Janet Hoskins after that. Go ahead, Eric. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Good. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, um, super helpful, actually, to think about the 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 kind of the the scope of of the study. I have um, two questions. Uh, one is thinking about the second generation of scholarship um as you described it uh all sorts of language of innovation and new and transformation and new and new and new and um i'm wondering if to what degree there's something really new happening and to what degree do we actually just see people paying attention to what's been going on for a long time and the first generation of or the you know the pre-1965 and the first generation of, of scholars just ignored it or didn't realize it was going on or, or what ha what have you the second the second question um and it really points to it's it's really about the third generation of of uh or the the contemporary spirit mediums in in um, mainland Southeast Asia. Um, Nathan Kaplan's book on monastic education in Korea points to really interesting ways in which Korean Buddhists in their institutional structures are clearly reading um, European and American scholarship and histories of, of uh, Buddhist studies. And it informs Buddhist education in Korea in in very interesting ways, um, and and you know so there's this feedback loop, and I'm and I'm wondering to what degree do we see um, uh, spirit mediums in contemporary Thailand, uh, for example? Um, how much are they aware of the scholarship that you've just been talking about? Uh, are, are do they know about it, or is it or is it something that's um, you know, not not visible to them. Thanks very much. Yeah, great questions. So the first one, I think it is, you know, part of the distinctive approach, part of the distinctiveness between the first and the second generation is there are different generations of anthropologists, so they're bringing different assumptions and 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 techniques. You see a lot more attention to like cultural politics and uh, uh, historical dynamics and historical ethnography right, in the second generation that wasn't there in the first. And there is also this sense of, um, uh, you know, a lot of these second generation anthropologists have also they've 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 migrated you know from studying rural peasant society to other kinds of social domains so um part of the newness is that they're looking anew right there's no, I, I i have not been able to find any you know sustained ethnographic studies of religion in chiang mai or bangkok right that really sort of uh attend in much that are actually set in that earlier generation from 65 to 85. There aren't that many, right? Anthropologists doing work in urban areas, texter, I mean, there's a bit here and there and you can see you can see little suggestive echoes of, of what the second generation discovers. So I am quite certain that it was there to a certain degree previously, right? And one way I do know that is um, there were some Japanese skull anthropologists who did their traditionally amazingly, you know, like empirically detailed studies of religion in Bangkok. And um, I finally got their work translated into English. 
And I, but I could tell from the visuals there and they were doing work. You know, the, the work I have is from the 70s and they're clearly discussing um, religious and social forms organized around possession that are echoes of what the scholars are finding in that in from like the 80s on. Um, they don't look exactly the same. They're precursors that have their own kind of like dynamics. They seem to be coming out of urban Chinese popular religiosity in Bangkok as much. So there's so that suggests that, you know, in that case, it wasn't it wasn't, you know, it wasn't because the, the ideas were transmitted from like the rural society and reworked. It's coming from an alter, a different kind of in, a talk and indigenous source that that the prior generations of scholar anthropologists just tended not to see because they weren't doing work in urban areas. So there's something definitely there. But the you know, the documentary evidence is is pretty fragmented and not very extensive. But I assume what you're suggesting is true. And similarly, we actually sort of get a decreasing sense of these questions in terms of rural society in the 80s and the 90s among Western scholar anthropologists because they're not doing the same kinds of intense studies there. So we can't even track how it's changing in the rural areas. You do, in the third generation, you have more scholars like Benjamin Bauman and others looking at possession in rural areas in the wake of all these transformations and reimaginings and, and seeing things colliding in ways, right? Um, and in terms of that kind of weather mediums, so most of the, the, of the spirit mediums I've ever encountered in my work from the 90s on in Bangkok, that's where I did my research. They're not particularly um, fluent in English. So the degree that they get access to academic models, it's because they're reading Thai language popular press, which often will draw on Thai anthropologists who are studying religion and contemporary society and maybe even possession. And those Thai scholars have been informed by those seminal works by the first generation of, of, of foreign scholars, right? Or even earlier ones like Thai scholars like Prarajamon and whatnot like that. So, so they're getting it maybe two or three degrees of distance and reserve and mediation, right? And they're encountering it because they're encountering it in the mass media, there's much more spectacularization and drama, right, around these kinds of visions of what it means to be a, a spirit medium. There's not this sort of more um, sort of reserved scholarly kind of annotation and detail and notation. So I think some of it is seeping through. I mean, they're clearly reading, you know, spirit mediums I've always encountered. I mean, they're just, you know, they're deeply reading like popular mass media and all this other stuff. And um, in fact, now, you know, I didn't talk about the Thai language scholarship on spirit mediums, but you know, I've come across recent dissertations by Thai monks who have studied spirit mediums, right? So there's a complex kind of conversation going on between academics and spirit mediums as well, um, being mediated through language, right? And class and all this other stuff. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of Thai, you know, master's students who have gone out and done studies of, of ceremonial cycles that involve spirit mediums and possession all over the country, right? As parts of kind of local ethnic or territorial identity and social worlds. And that's out there. And it's all like, you know, it's all available for download, digital download now, right? And, and you know, so it'd be hard to track, but I wouldn't be surprised if this stuff doesn't start reverberating to the greater degree that they become you know, uh, literate in accessing and using and knowing about this kind of uh, uh, scholastic work about popular religion and spirit possession and mediumship that's floating around out there. So thanks for the questions, yeah. Janet, we have a question from you and then after Janet from Karen Myers. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd actually like to ask the same question that you asked me during discussion <laughs> to Eric, um, you know, why, why do you think that the Vietnamese studies of spirit possession have been somewhat siloed? Um, after I provided one approximate answer, another one sort of occurred to me, but I'd rather hear directly from you what you think. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll offer up my thoughts and then I'd be interested to hear what you think too. I mean, in general, I have to be honest, the study of religion in Myanmar, Thailand, 
Laos and Cambodia has tended to not pay attention to the Vietnamese world. I mean, across the board, you know, I think part of it is, is it's not seen as part of this sort of Theravada majority world. There are parts of Vietnam that sort of have that presence. So it just hasn't been part of the, the training of scholars. Um, it's more complicated because clearly there's a kind of cynic world, right? A cynic kind of logic of organizing religion and popular religion that's going on there. And so it's a little more challenging for scholars of mainland Southeast Asian Theravada Buddhist majority countries who have not been exposed to that kind of scholarship and ideas and literature. But it is a problem and it's kind of ironic because, you know, it is, it is very common in the history, at least of Thai, you know, Buddhism to point to these important figures who are introduced innovation. And often it's these, it's, it's, it's the, it's the Sino Thais who have been sort of negotiating different religious worlds and they have spun out new ideas inside of Thai Buddhism and Thai religiosity in general. So the same logic would apply to spirit possession because actually there's lots of Thai Buddhists, even if they're not Sino Thai, who have now, you know, they're exposed to the Chinese pantheon and logics and they're claiming that, you know, they're being possessed by, Thai, uh, by Chinese gods of various sorts and all of this, even if they're not Sino-Thai in terms of their own ethnic origins, right, in history. And so it would make sense for, um, for Thai scholars or for scholars of spear possession in Thailand and in, you know, other, the other countries of mainland Southeast Asia to really pay attention more not only to Vietnam, but to the Sinitic kind of world of religiosity and how it has influenced historically in the past and in the present what's going on um, in where they're working. Um, and it's actually kind of, you know, it's, it's kind of, I'll be honest, like I have, I have diligently collected as much of the scholarship on Vietnamese spirit possession and mediums as I can find, but I haven't had the time to dig through it because there's in the detail I'd like to, but it's embarrassing because, you know, between 2005 and now, there's been an explosion of monographs and edited volumes that actually just dwarfs what's going on in the mainland Theravada part of, of Southeast Asia um, that's, that's been studying this you know, for decades longer. And yet as a publishing kind of project, it has not produced you know, edited volumes and monographs in the same way. There are very few monographs you know, focused in a narrow sense on spirit possession and spirit mediumship in, in the Theravada majority part of mainland Southeast Asia, right? Um, so I think it's mostly about training and exposure and maybe, you know, prop language, right? You know, like you know, to a certain degree, you, it, it, it's the usual problem. You know, like you'd have to study Vietnamese and you'd really, you know, it would be good to know Chinese as well to really be able to make sense of this stuff. And it's, it's just, you know, it's it's uh, it's difficult because of training and constraint. Were there other thoughts you had that? Um, I actually had a, a different response, which was more about the influence of Vietnamese language scholars. Um, partly because it was it was very difficult to study religion at one point in Vietnam, and the fact that it has become more possible for Vietnamese scholars and for foreign scholars is something we owe in part to um, a particular folklore institute run by Ngo Duc Thinh that has been very influential. And, uh, but I think what's also true is that when you talk to people from other parts of Southeast Asia, they say, well, the Vietnamese aren't really as Buddhist as we are, <laughs> which may be a kind of local ethnocentrism. They're not Theravada Buddhist. Um, and, and certainly Buddhism doesn't have the place in Vietnam that it has in Thailand. The, the place of tremendous power and sort of central um, religious influence because Buddhism is competing against many other uh, forms of religiosity. And um, one thing that, that this Folklore Institute did is they, they labeled spirit possession as, as a Dao, Dao Mao. And that in itself makes it in a sense independent from Buddhism although there are a lot of these collaborations that you're talking about, and certainly there are monks who collaborate with spirit mediums and so forth. But um, that has sort of reconfigured the religious field in interesting ways. Yeah. No, I think that's all true. And I don't yeah. think 
I don't think heritage and folklore studies sort of has played the same sort of thing in the Theravada mainland world. And, um, um, and there is something about the complicated sectarianism, right? Even in terms of Buddhism, but beyond that of the religious world of Vietnam that is confusing and challenging to scholars trained to think about, you know, religious worlds that are clearly dominated by a kind of Theravadan sectarian, whatever it's local vernacularization, a, ter a singular Theravadan kind of orthodoxy, right? Um, so I think that's part of it too, yeah. Thanks. Karen, you can go ahead. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks for that talk. I really appreciated the literature review. Um, I work more in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, but so I was curious as to how much of the um, literature, you talked a little bit about cross-cultural analysis between these, you know, Southeast Asian countries, but how much of the uh, literature really engages, I mean, it's a worldwide phenomenon, right? Spirit possession. Um, and if you could cite any works that really engage in that comparative uh, question in a robust way. Well, I have to say, I've always been surprised that scholars working on spirit possession in Theravada Buddhist Southeast Asia um, have not tended to look outside the region and the sectarian orders the way I would have imagined. Again, I have large collections of scholarship on possession in Tibetan Buddhism and even China and India, right? And especially Sri Lanka. I gotta say, that's the most striking thing. Most scholars working on spirit possession in Myanmar or Thailand, Cambodia, they never think about the Sri Lankan case, which is just so obvious. Um, you know, John Holt has seen this book and he was kind of like, where's, where's Sri Lanka in this project? And I was like, well, they envisioned it in a regional sense. So they didn't go there, but there's another reason for whatever reason, it's just that linguistic cultural zone and training thing. They just don't seem to look there again, just like in Vietnam, there's a large body of monographs and volumes and other stuff about spirit possession in Sri Lanka. And yet I don't find scholars thinking about it. I try to think about it, um, but honestly, it's, you know, I think, I don't know. So, um, and then going beyond that, I mean, you know, spirit possession looks different, like in India, it looks very different in Tibet, right? And then I, you know, I mean, like East Asia is, is another world, right? You could have an interesting comparative volume about how spirit possession is configured differently in these regions and the sectarian traditions. And I hope people try to sort of, you know, uh, open up those kinds of conversations and projects because I think it would be very fruitful and would, would energize the study to see the kinds of, I mean, I've taken part in these sort of, these workshops on Buddhism, that's, you know, that had been run in Paris and, you know, and that kind of cross sectarian cross regionalism has been very um, instructive and informative mm -hmm. for me thinking about what I'm seeing on the ground, his, you know, uh, in the present, but also what people have talked about in terms of the past, in terms of mainland Southeast Asia and or Thailand. So um, you can, if you contact me, you know, sort of I'd have to stop and think about, you know, the scholarship that actually does try to, 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 to make those sorts of connections. Um, honestly, a lot of the anthropologists have been only intermittently engaged with, there's a whole body of conceptual, analytical, theoretical work about just spirit possession inside of anthropology. And they've, they've been, you know, it, it hasn't had a very significant impact for the most part. It's interesting. I Sometimes, you know, Thai study scholars have have drank the Kool-Aid of a kind of exceptionalism a little too much. And it's sort of made them, you know, inoculated against doing that. But um, so I'm not sure why, but, you know, so there's a lot of other, right, kinds of mm -hmm. theoretical works either coming out of other regions. Uh, and I would say, you know, the the introduction by Peter and Benedict does try to engage with some of this stuff, think critically about how that absence has influenced past scholarship and our approaches. They don't sort of rectify the problem, but they note. I mean, they basically argue, you know, that there is a Southeast Asian possession complex. And I agree and disagree with them in certain ways about that, but they're basically like, you know, let's think about regional possession in terms of like different kinds of 
you know, regionalized kind of complexes that have a different, you know, distinct kinds of historical and social logics. And they are, you know, they suggest that scholars working on Buddhist Southeast Asia start thinking like that. Um, so, so there are efforts to sort of push that way, but it's not clear how much it'll be taken up by future mm -hmm. scholars. Yeah, thank you. It seems because one of the questions is how does it relate to Buddhism? <laughs> and so we could look at other Buddhist cultures, but also non-Buddhist cultures that have spirit possession to get a like, sort of broader perspective. But I do think that, this but... comes, so, actually your comment makes me say that again, you know, the so the earliest scholars laid down these kinds of foundational sort of frames and assumptions. And the fact that the, you know, the earliest scholar, you know, Spiro and uh, and Tambaya and Kirsch were working with this sort of issue of great traditions, little traditions, and you know, Buddhism and localization and all of that, that has tended to then sort of close out other kinds of optics and horizons and made scholars a little content later generations of scholars just sort of not see analytic and theoretical possibilities because they're like that's the big issue how does spirit possession fit inside of buddhist logics and actors and the buddhist religious field but what about all these other kinds of questions um they tend to be just sort of they weren't they're not on the horizon and so scholars don't always sort of see them they don't jump out at them um, yeah, thank and you. i did and i did sort of frame it in terms of that particular line of argument. Um, so, okay. This is really great. I, I've just, Karen, I wanted to thank you for that question because it's inspired me to talk to some of my colleagues across the different area councils. You know, we're Southeast Asian studies, but my colleagues in East Asian studies and South Asian studies and other places too, interested in these kinds of questions. And then I was thinking, well, we have some initiative to think of a kind of trans-regional Buddhist studies, but it also makes us maybe need to rethink that too, right? Um, it, there's certainly great reason to do that, but to think maybe a transnational spirit possession studies or something would be a really interesting kind of framework as well. Um, I said that Tak Chalam Tiarana had a, a question, but in fact, he, may, he was waving to one of us, so I don't want to force him to have a question, but I, knowing Tak, he always has a good question to ask. So I'll give you the opportunity, Tak, if you want to take up the offer. Actually, uh, I was waving at Rick, Rick Ruth. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the question I had was already answered because when listening to all this, I was thinking about spirit uh, possession in Southeast Asia uh -huh. and the other um, place that a lot of studies have been made is actually the Philippines. And so I was, well, I was going to ask Eric whether, you know, instead of talking about just Buddhism, if he can talk about spirit possession. And the Philippines is, is an interesting case, right? It's Catholic and, or, or non-Catholic. No, it is, right? For the, for the broader, you know, but again, for I think scholars working in mainland Southeast Asia, they're intimidated. When you go to the insular world, it's not just, you know, social, cultural, political logics, you know, an organization be different, but then you're encountering Islam and Christianity, right, in, in a certain sense, as these world historical traditions. And there is a sense that monotheistic traditions, you know, have treated spirit possession slightly different than non-monotheistic traditions, have been less accommodating often, um, at least, you know, scholarship tends to suggest that. So it's not like things couldn't be learned, but I think Again, they see it as a little like, like, you know, it would be, I think it would be an easier step up to, to look at like spirit possession in the Chinese world and in the Vietnamese world, right? And in the South Asian world, um, uh, to the degree that they're in this sort of uh, non-monotheistic dominated kind of religious orders. And it's, it's another step up then to take into account what's going on with spirit possession when you're, when you're in, um, uh, a Christian or an Islamic kind of world that actually has often seems to have stronger prohibitions to exclude it, right? I mean, you know, despite being, you know, early scholars thinking that spirit possession is the subordinated marginal sort of thing, it is, you know, it's recognized by Buddhists and it is, it is accommodated, right? And tolerated in certain ways, um, except for some of the most modernist, high modernist kinds of Thai Buddhists or Myanmar Buddhists who denounce it thoroughly, right? Um, but there's a kind of accepting accommodation of it 
which can sometimes seem to be harder in certain kinds of um, Christian and Muslim kinds of environments. So it would definitely be, you know, especially if you want to work the regional kind of character, right? Um, if, the, if Benedict and Peter are talking about a Southeast Asian sort of possession complex, they are mostly thinking about it in terms of the mainland, right? They haven't, you know, expanded that horizon to uh, the insular world, um, which, which, could, which would introduce certain kinds of complexities. Um, thanks. I received a note from Rick Ruth, who got the spirit of the wave from talk and now wishes to answer a question as well. I'm and sorry, yeah. Yeah, just actually two things really quick. First of all, I wanted to wish uh, Eric White a happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> you <him>. bum. <laughs> I did remember it was your birthday and thank him for doing this uh, for it. And actually I was thinking a lot maybe about, uh, in some ways we've been talking about blending what we've seen as Asian American studies with uh, regional studies a lot lately. I noticed more and more departments are combining or considering them together. And this afternoon, we've been talking about, uh, in some ways, the geographical siloing, I guess, between Vietnam and Thailand and, and the Philippines. Now, what I found myself wondering is, uh, in terms of diasporic studies, uh, are there studies of spirit medium, uh, even specifically uh, Thai Kung Song Jiao, turning up uh, in the United States? I mean, in our lifetime, mm. in this kind of half century that you've described, we've seen, you know, Thai Wat uh, appearing in more and more states across the country as part of, of that uh, manifestation of, of Southeast Asian religion in North America or in Europe. Are there Kuan Song Jiao in, in the United States and are there anthropologists studying? Them? So interestingly, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure I know the literature as, as well as I could or should, but if, and I think off the top of my head, um, it's in terms of the diaspora in America. And it's interestingly, I have seen analyses of spirit possession in, in sort of Southeast Asian diasporic America in the Cambodian and the Laotian worlds because of the, the demographics of, you know, uh, refugees and migration, right? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it's not popping up in, you know, Burmese and Thai worlds as well. Um, but I've seen a few pieces of scholarship, but not a lot. Um, so it is, it is sort of, uh, there is a touch of that, but um, I've never seen anything about spirit possession amongst ethnic Thais outside of mainland, outside of Southeast Asia or the extended sort of world of, on the borderlands, uh, so, for instance. So maybe this is somewhere where then a fourth generation can go with it then or? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's later. yeah, that's certainly one, you know, one direction. I mean, there's so many different directions. I talk about issues and directions in my afterward and Peter and Benedict talk mm -hmm. about it as well in their book. Um, I think actually, ironically, you know, in, in, in relation to what Janet was talking about, uh, or, or Karen, there's actually a, 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 a sense of, of going more intensely into the Southeast Asian world, which is to say, increasingly scholars are pushing back on the idea of, okay, so there's this common kind of Theravada Buddhist so, you know, religious logic across all of mainland Southeast Asia, right? But if you, you know, they're like, if you look at the pantheons, the pantheons don't look the same. The pantheons of possessing spirits don't look the same across the countries and even regions within the country. And you can see the language and even the kinds of the styles and kind, the modalities of spirit possession um, that are valorized and worth, you know, uh, cultivating, they don't look the same across these different worlds. So there's actually a, increasingly a sense that we have to pay more attention to actually the historical and social specificity of what, you know, um, these religious worlds and fields look like, you know, underneath the umbrella of the nation state, which tends to sort of artificially homogenize everything, much less the umbrella of Theravada, which can even more powerfully homogenize everything. And there's a sense that actually, you know, you've got very localized pantheons that are kind of uh, 
open-ended and generatively playing. And Paul Sorrentino's article about Vietnamese spirit possession in the mon in the edited volume goes into great detail about sort of the 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 the, cr the creative um, ambiguities and slippages within the Vietnamese pantheon that has allowed you know, spirit possession to take on these different shapes over from the colonial era to the modern era and and actually ch jostling with visions of what the pantheon is and who's in and out and, and the logics of interacting with them. But the same thing I think applies to the local Theravada Buddhist worlds of possession and mediumship across the rest of mainland Southeast Asia. And so, um, so that's, you know, so that's a different kind, that's a totally different angle. Instead of sort of going out, it's even going deeper to really sort of pay attention to local history and society and culture and politics and how it has shaped things so that it's not all like all spirit mediumship looks the same from Mandalay to 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 Phnom Penh to to you know Luang Prabang, right? Um Well, th this brings us to 1.30. So I think I'm going to bring the, the formal part of our discussion to a close and I'll stop the recording. But please join me in a, a round of applause for Eric's talk. And you're welcome to linger a little bit for informal chit chat for a few moments. <laughs>